morning, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown, uh, just one lap. Uh, joining me is Chris Eddy, uh, 10X, uh, Chris Rule, uh, Core Shares. Of course, 10X and Core Shares are now the same company, but still operating. The, the 10X space has got the, the, a lot of the retirement products. And then, of course, Core Shares has got what they're best known for is the ETF products. Listed this morning, an hour ago, is a new income fund code on the JSC is income. Uh, nice and simple in that regard. Gents, appreciate your time this morning. Uh, let's hand over to you. Uh, we'll take the presentation. Thanks, Simon. And thanks to all the, the participants for joining. It's really great to be chatting to you guys early Thursday morning on listing day. Today is the official listing day of the the uh, core shares income and then actively managed ETF. And we're going to unpack that long, boring name. But the important thing to focus in on is, is the income piece. So, so today we are very uh, pleased to announce that we have officially listed the first actively managed ETF. Now, I'm going to unpack this for just two minutes just for the audience so we can debunk, uh, you know, any, any strange analogies here. But the, the, the ETF legislation of ALT, um, only allowed for asset managers to list products that directly tracked an index. So in other words, like a top 40 index, you could list an ETF that then went and bought that exact index, but you couldn't list anything else. So it had to strictly be index tracking. Now this works really well when you're trying to get efficient exposure to individual asset classes. So it works really well if you're trying to get just SA equities or US equities or SA bonds and so on and so forth. Where it doesn't work particularly well is where you're trying to package up multi-asset solutions. So in other words, you're trying to put a whole lot of asset classes together um, to provide a particular outcome that is, that is predetermined, set out up front, um, and deliver on that objective with, with a number of, of, of factors that influence how you put together these asset classes in one portfolio. So... This new legislation, it's called actively, they're called actively managed ETFs. Um, but what you'll see is that it's not, you know, the, the business that, that you know as core shares and, and, and of course now uh, core shares by 10x and soon to be just exclusively 10x um, is predominantly index based. And, uh, it, you know, in, in the ETF world, we've always been purely index based. But what's a, a big part of our business, which we haven't been able to expose JSC investors too, is our multi-asset capability. So I'm joined by Chris, who heads up our multi-asset range. And, and this new active legislation allows us to put together funds that can invest in multiple asset classes um, and provide for a solution. So that means when I say a solution, when you're an investor at home, this is plug and play stuff. You don't need to put together different asset classes. You don't need to um, you know, uh, over, over, overthink the allocation. This is the total income solution. Chris is going to go into the exact details of the solution, but, but let's, let's unpack some of the high level stuff of the ETF just before we get there. So the uh, fund name is the Core Shares Income AM ETF. The JSC ticker is income. Um, this is a multi-asset fund, which means it invests across multiple asset classes. So it doesn't just invest like the traditional ETFs into one asset class that tracks an index. This invests into multiple asset classes. Chris is going to go into the detail there. And it's, it's, it's really designed to provide a high level of income with a low level of volatility or risk. And so, so, so it's really the, the, the category that, that this would sit in in the traditional unit trust world is what's called the multi-asset income category. So very key objective here is high levels in, of income with, with low levels of volatility. It lists today. So that's um, uh, 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 today is the listing date. We we on screen with a double um, and we have seeding money of about 500 million rand coming into the ETF uh, in the next few days. So by Monday, the AUM of the ETF will be around 500 million. So it's already at scale um, uh, uh, and really for, for us is really exciting because not only is it the first actively managed you know, ETF on, on the market, but it's the first true solution portfolio or holistic portfolio that lists as an ETF on the JSC. Um, I'm going to hand over to Chris, but, but, I'll, but, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the multi-asset credentials that Chris brings with him before I do so. So Chris looks after the multi-asset portfolio range at 10x. 
He's already managing an income fund in the unit trust world. That's around 3.8 billion in assets. Um, and the total multi-asset range in our group is sitting at around 20 billion in assets, which he looks after, ranging from multi-asset income all the way up to high equity. So, so, so what's been fantastic about the two businesses coming together is, is the bringing together of these, these core capabilities. One, efficient access to uh, market exposures, and that was like the ETF business that CoreShares brings to the table, and then the strong multi-asset capability that 10X brings to the table. So this is really a marriage of, 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 of the two capabilities, the ETF capability and the multi-asset capability. So we're, we're really excited to bring it to. So I'll hand over to Chris. Simon, in terms of some of the questions we'll unpack on the pref tracks, but I want to correct your initial statement. The pref tracks that's remandating on the 31st of May is remandating to a, a bond fund. Yeah. And I'll unpack that. I know there's a question coming on it. So it's actually not remandating to this fund. It's remandating to another, another fund. But we'll unpack that later. I just want to flag that uh, for, for the listeners. So Chris, Chris, over to you. Um, Thanks, Chris. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Chris mentioned, this is a, a multi-asset solution. We like to think of it as kind of a total income solution. Um, as you're building your portfolios, you'll have your equity holdings. Holding this one ETF can kind of cover the requirements from, from the income source. And diversification has always been a really important principle from a 10x perspective in the way that we manage our multi-asset portfolios. On the left-hand side, you can see whilst all the asset classes are a combination of fixed or floating rate uh, instruments, there's a wide range both in terms of type of instruments, so from SA nominal government bonds to inflation-linked bonds, from a geographic perspective as well, um, through the cycle, we see uh, about 20% of this portfolio invested in uh, offshore markets, uh, primarily in offshore investment grade and offshore high yield credit. Um, there's an allocation to the local credit market as well as uh, a liquidity pot from a money market perspective. So if you kind of, that gives you a sense in terms of really from an asset allocation perspective, there are lots of different income sources in the portfolio that really looks to kind of smooth out the profile whilst delivering an income, uh, income uh, into the portfolio. So that split local offshore, about 80% local, 20% offshore. And how we think about it in terms of like an aggregated exposure is about a 50% allocation to duration, a 40% allocation to credit, and a 10% allocation to liquidity. So that's kind of a high level overview of uh, the composition of the portfolio. But I wanna spend some time just unpacking the opportunity that actually uh, exists in income markets, both locally and globally at present. I think for the last more than a decade, certainly from an offshore perspective, income and bonds have really been a forgotten asset class where you had US cash interest rates pretty much at zero. And you can see that the USD cash uh, uh, on the chart in front, that blue bar is really the last 10-year range. And the pink dot right at the top of the blue bar shows you the current yield, or this is at, as at the end of March on, on US cash. So after delivering hard currency uh, interest rates of pretty much close to zero, you're now getting more than 5% in a hard currency investing in dollar cash. Similarly, from a... South African bond perspective, um, given some of the volatility that we saw last week, South African 10-year government debt is yielding uh, close to 12%, which again is right at kind of the, 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 the upper end of the range that we've seen over the last 10 years. And interestingly, from a, from a South African cash perspective, 12-month South African cash, so NCDs from banks, are paying you about 9.6%. And that kind of, in contrast to where the repo rate is at 7.75, uh, there's, there's quite a nice uplift there. So that just gives you a sense of the opportunities currently available from income as an asset class. The chart that we've pulled up here looks at the real yield on a 10-year South African inflation-linked bond. And this is really a great 
starting place to think about the opportunity available in income. Because what, I want, what we always try to do is bring back how we manage money to the outcome that we're looking to achieve. So Chris mentioned earlier that we, uh, or it was on the, on the earlier slide, the strategy is looking over a three-year time horizon to deliver inflation plus 2.5%. Real yields at the end of March were around about 4.5% on a 10-year government uh, inflation-linked bond. Um, as at uh, yesterday, that was much closer to 5. So CPI plus 5 from holding an inflation-linked bond is quite a hard, high hurdle against which other assets in your portfolio need to compete. You think about it, actually, a, a great uh, comparison is that over the last 10 years, South African equities have delivered inflation plus 4.5%. So the current yield you can lock in by investing in inflation-linked bonds is actually higher than what SA equities have delivered over the last uh, 10, 10 years. So really, the opportunity that exists in fixed income at the moment, together with actually launching the solution, we think it's at quite an opportune time that, that the solution is coming to market. Um, in terms of some of the opportunities available, so this is just kind of looking at the shape of the yield curve to give you a sense in terms of how we like to, to, to build our portfolio. What we ultimately looking to do here is deliver the highest level of income for the least level of risk. We're not necessarily making an, a call in terms of the direction of which interest rates are moving in. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, well, where based on the yield curve can we kind of put together a combination of different bonds that can maximize the interest at the lowest possible level of risk. And you can see, as an example, we've got the seven year, eight year, nine year, and 12 year kind of highlighted in a lighter blue. And that's the part of the South African government bond yield curve that we think is attractive because past that 12 year point, you're not really getting any additional yield, but you're taking on a lot more interest rate risk. And similarly, at the short ends for the 186, it's, it's moved quite a lot since, uh, since this chart has been presented, but was actually a four-year government bond was yielding less than 12-month cash. And for us, that doesn't necessarily make sense because, again, you're taking on a lot more risk. So how we think about it, we are accessing the 12-month cash part of um, uh, the yield curve, which is currently yielding about 9.6%, as well as that sort of belly of the government bond curve. And together, that maximizes the yield that we can bring into the portfolio whilst minimizing that interest rate risk. The other, the other really important part of this portfolio, so besides sort of duration, which we've spoken about there, which is kind of, you can think about that as government bond exposure. The other aspect is the credit part of the portfolio, which also delivers yield into the portfolio. Now, what we've pulled up here you would have seen in terms of our strategic asset allocation, there's about a 20% allocation to global credit and a 20% allocation to SA credit. Most income funds in South Africa have a much higher allocation to SA credit because that's the universe that we know, that's the universe that we exist in. But our approach to managing credit risk is really twofold. The first is that we need to ensure diversification at an issuer level and across sectors and geographies. So we're not overly concentrated in any one sector or any one company in case that company defaults. And, and the second aspect is the spread that you buy that credit at. But to really contrast how concentrated the local credit market is, we, we consolidated all the issuers and we stripped out things like SOEs and municipalities and some securitizations. And what you're left with in the SA credit universe is 53 issuers. That's the entire SA listed credit universe. Out of that, more than 70% are financial. So you can think about our banks and insurance businesses. If you add in real estate, financials and real estate make up effectively 80% of the issuers. And we think that as a market, it's a highly concentrated market compared to what's available on a global scale. Now, there are thousands of global issuers, but how we've decided to access global credit as an asset class is we've built a well-diversified um, sort of index of global credit, which covers US and European issuers across investment grade and high yield. 
And there are 425 issuers in that basket. And with a 20% allocation to global credit, each issuer only makes up five basis points of exposure in the portfolio. And really that's how we're looking to manage that, um, that, that, that credit risk in the portfolio and really contrast a concentrated local credit universe to the global opportunities that are available and really important in terms of ultimately managing the outcome that we're looking to deliver in this portfolio. So the one aspect of managing credit risk is diversification. The other is the spread that you pay. And here we're talking about a spread above government bonds. So this is really the additional yield that you're being compensated for for taking on the credit risk of individual issues. Now, from a South African credit perspective, and actually um, I think we're expecting a, a, an updated S&P rating of the, of the sovereign tomorrow, um, South Africa is rated sub-investment grade. So it's a double B rating. And the spread above government bonds for the SA credit universe is around about 120 basis points on average. If you contrast that to global high yield, which has the same double B rating, you're being paid 450 basis points. So that the, you're getting a much higher spread for a much more diversified basket. And really that for us, from an investment opportunity set, there's really no comparison to the local credit market. Because with a similar rating, you're being paid 120 20 basis points, and that's really a risk that we think that you're not being re rewarded for. You contrast that to global investment grade, which has much higher ratings than effectively uh, local credits on a global basis, and you can see that those yields are a lot more aligned to each other. So that's just a couple of thoughts in terms of how we look to build the portfolio, the opportunities that are currently available um, in the market from an income perspective, as well as how we manage some of those risks in the portfolio, ultimately with a, the end objective of looking to deliver inflation plus 2.5% over a rolling three-year basis and do that uh, with materially lower risk than what you would have investing in broad-based government bonds. Just a point in terms of um, some expectations around um, sensitivities to, to move in, in, in interest rates, because we know that uh, South African government bonds have been moving around quite a lot recently. The limit from a duration perspective or interest rate perspective on this portfolio is three years. So what that will mean is if government bonds increase by about 1% in yield, sort of the, the maximum loss that you could expect from this portfolio is in the region of about 2%. If it was purely just invested in government bonds, but it's not. It's invested in offshore assets. There's some hard currency exposure, global credit. So that diversification would see um, kind of that downside even further mitigated. But just to give you a sense of uh, the, the risk associated to the portfolio in a raising rate, rate environment. So maybe, Chris, I can hand back to you and you can uh, kind of summarize the, the, the offering. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, and I mean, we've tried to keep it short and sweet to open the floor for questions and take as many questions as possible. So, so I guess the question is, you know, well, so what? And why don't I just keep doing what I was doing? I mean, that's that's obviously the the important piece. I think there are a few really important elements to this portfolio that that should make it a, a really compelling value proposition inside of a tr traditional securities portfolio. The one is something we talk about a lot and it's access. So it's accessing various pools of assets that as a, a, an individual and, and not even an individual, but, but a lot of institutions is just simply not possible. So, so I'm talking about some of these pools of assets that are typically traded very infrequently. They're traded directly with institutions. This is like some of the credit exposure in the portfolio, which is you know, very difficult to get access to on screen, um, both local and global credit. I mean, to get exposure to 425 odd names of global credit as an individual is extremely, extremely difficult. So this, this provides access to that and also access to preferential rates. The reality is in the market, and Chris was talking about like 12 month bank yields of nine and a half percent, you know, as, a, as an institution, we're coming in at wholesale and at, at bulk, 
we're getting that rate at about nine and a half percent. The average individual is getting 12 month call at around eight. So you get a significant yield pickup just because of the wholesale nature that we transact in, because we direct, you know, directly dealing with these treasury desks at the banks. And 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 what it what this then packaged up for you means that now on screen, so accessibility is now available to these instruments as a function of us going and buying those assets and holding them in our portfolio. So it's a really important thing to consider is this, this idea of accessibility. And in the ETF world, what you find is where ETFs are really useful for client portfolio construction is when they provide accessibility. So the obvious examples like some of the commodity ETFs, you know, previously gold was quite a hard thing to access. You had to go buy physical, keep it under your bed, all these kind of funny things. Suddenly there was a gold ETF you could buy it alongside your SA equity portfolio, hold it in there, great diversifier. This is the same concept where, you know, you couldn't go and access 12 month uh, NCDs at nine and a half percent. Well, now you can. You couldn't go and access a, gro a global and a local basket of credit on screen. Now you can. Really, the only thing you could access on screen is some of the liquid government bonds. And so, so this, this provides access to these, 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 these instruments that are challenging to get hold of. Um, and packages it up in a holistic solution where the idea is that we are delivering bond or bond-like returns with less risk. And that risk is what Chris was talking about earlier, driven by two pieces. The one is du duration, so interest rate sensitivity, and the other is diversification. So not purely ex you know, exposed to, let's say, SA government or or SA credit, but looking at global baskets, looking at money markets, looking at different parts of, of, of the income curve. So a solution, a solution like this um, really, we believe, has application in, in, in portfolio construction because what we're typically doing when we're building up wealth is looking to, um, at some point, generate income. And now how do we generate these sustainable high levels of income with minimal risk? Well, we can generate it through these kind of assets, which previously were not accessible on screen. And so really looking at how can clients generate income? How can they co combine a, an ETF like this, take an income alongside, let's say, their equity portfolio or their or their other you, the, the other ETF exposure they have, which may be equities and bonds, et cetera, to enhance their yield and reduce their risk? And really, it comes down to individual portfolio construction. So, so, you know, we think this portfolio is a fantastic tool for investors to think about how they can A, target a particular level of income and B, how they can use it as a risk mitigation tool alongside what is typically um, a risky assets, so equities, property, et cetera, and, and leveraging up and down that risk and income toggle, if you could use that uh, expression, to, to, to generate a very... Uh, bespoke, very customized outcome for that particular investor. So, so yeah, really, this is a total income solution, highly diversified. It's coming in at zero point three eight percent, which is the packaging of the fee, and that that's the management fee. TR expected to land in the mid forties uh, or, or, or early forties. And, and of course, what's really different about this is, is that it's listed, the access is convenient, it's inside your online uh, stockbroking portfolios. So yeah, that, 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 that's our story. We'd really love to encourage a lot of questions here. Um, uh, a, few, a few other interesting pieces, just, just like anecdotes for the, for, for, for the audiences. The one thing that we want to be clear is that we're not an active house, so we're not making security selection decisions here. You, you would have seen in Chris's presentation, he talks about asset class exposure, about buying big pools of assets, about getting exposure to a portion of the government bond curve. This is not about saying, oh, you know, Trueworths is really showing value in the credit space and we're going to go pick it out. So we're not active, but this is also not passive because of these asset allocation decisions. So it sits somewhere in between. What do we think is really important in terms of delivering outcomes? We think strategic asset allocation is really important. So we are strategic here. We think efficient exposure to asset classes is really important. We think keeping costs low is really important. So 0.38 uh, as, a, as a management fee is best in class in terms of income solutions uh, in, in this market segment. And the other thing that we've always prided ourselves in is, is transparency. So 
on a daily basis, you can go download the holdings, see what's in the ETF, understand, unpack that that piece of the portfolio. So it's 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 very much a hybrid of using active legislation, but packaging up all of the 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 value propositions that we previously uh, are, are are known for. And uh, yeah, we really we really excited to engage with the market on this on this solution. We think there's a there's a lot of application for for its use inside of our, our uh, traditional ETF uh, portfolios. Thanks, uh, Chris and Chris. Folks, send your questions if you got them. We've got a bunch already. Uh, I'm seeing one or two comments, including on Twitter, that you can't see it on your broker's platform. That's your broker. Poke them. I've checked my broker. I've checked, uh, in fact, I've got two brokers. And they've both got it available. Code is income. I do know that some brokers uh, don't go on day one just because they're a manual process and it'll come through the next day. But it is there and it is trading. Uh, some of the questions coming through. Robin's saying no exposure to uh, international real estate. Any any reason for that? Because you had a little bit there of, 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 of uh, uh, local. No, so so actually in in, in this portfolio there, there there's there's no exposure to listed property both both local or international. So kind of okay. what we try to do here is is focus on fixed and floating rate securities. The the I think the local property that we were uh, referring okay. to there was effectively the credit exposure. So it would have been credit instruments from from local listed real estate. And similarly, there there may be some credit instruments in the global basket. Gotcha. Um, so it would be a growth point bond, not a growth point REIT. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, question coming through. Is this going to be available in tax-free accounts? I see no reason why not. I mean, it, it, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the rules against tax-free is there mustn't be derivatives in there. There mustn't be performance fees. It can come into tax-free? It's uh, Simon, it's a good question. It is a collective investment scheme. So yeah. CIS is qualify. The tax-free legislation doesn't specifically say um, the AM ETFs, but it does talk about ETFs and collective investment schemes. Yeah. So in principle, there's no reason why it shouldn't qualify. It, it ticks all the boxes. And for example, the equivalent product as a CIS qualifies. So, so we're confident that it's, it, it qualifies. Yeah, I see it. no reason why not. I know the AMCs, actively managed certificates, do not qualify for tax-free, and that's because they are structured products. This is not. Okay. This is an ETF. In this case, it's an active ETF, but no reason why not. Any idea of yield at uh, listing? Yeah, sure. So, so the the yield is currently in the region of about nine point five percent. So that's where kind of the, the the total current yield of the portfolio is sitting. Perfect. Um, uh, another question coming through. Uh, I want to park those for a moment. Uh, there we go. Um, distribution frequency. Um, that's a, a quarterly distribution. Quarterly distribution. And, and then a question here coming through in terms of tax efficiency. Now, obviously, uh, the distributions paid out are going to be, I, I imagine, income because these are interest and, 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 and the like. So they'll come through. Is there any tax drag on, on tax that will be paid within the fund on those distributions? We see it on some of the offshore ETS where we have a, a dual tax agreement with the US, but there is still some uh, of that uh, tax kept in by the IRS. Yeah, so um, in terms of how we're accessing the global credit, there's no sort of uh, double taxation within the fund because um, we, we, we're not doing it through through ETF uh, structures globally. A question, Chris Rule, for you. I mean, the difference between an active ETF like this and a unit trust. I mean, my sense is more than anything, it's about the platform. With the, with 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 a unit trust, I've got to go to a list. Whereas, yeah, this is just available on on the JSC to anyone who has access to the JSC. Yeah, it's 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 virtually the same thing. It's they're both collective investment schemes. They both have virtually identical deeds. The only difference in the deeds is the the mechanism for trade. So so as you said, you know the the ETF trades on exchange, and mm -hmm. the unit trust trade directly with the management company or via other platforms. So that, there's really no material difference. The 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 one thing that 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 gets people hung up and, and why operationally ETFs don't coexist next to unit trust is this idea of fractional units. So ETFs trade in whole units. So you're buying oh, okay. an entire unit. Unit trust, you can buy like 3.879 units. You do, it's oh. a RAND based. So, so that's really the operational difference. But, but, but for all intents and purposes, this is the same thing. Um, just, just trades in a different environment. 
Oh, it's so long and, since and, I've had a unit trust. I'd forgotten they did fractions. Yeah, it's so funny because like everyone's going, like, well, this is crazy. Like actively managed ETFs, you know, 10X doing active managed ETFs. And if you look at the, the, the side of our business where all the assets are, multi-asset portfolios, these are effectively actively managed unit trusts. They, yeah. We use indexation, we use strategic asset allocation, low cost, all those good things. But in terms of how the ETF legislation was so particular, it wasn't permissible. So we're doing the same thing. We're just making what was available in CIS now, now on screen in, in the ETF wrap. Yeah. And of course, there are, are, are passive uh, 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 well indexed uh, uh, unit trusts at the same time. So are you asking if you'd be able to get it at computer share? Absolutely. It's JC listed, no problem at all there. I'm not seeing any more questions. So Chris, let's hit the, the pref tracks. Uh, a couple of questions coming through. Folks are asking, you know, are they going to convert into this fund? The answer is no. The other question is what happens happens uh, uh, at, at the end of the month when that when when the pref tracks uh, is is, is uh, remandated yeah so this uh, 10x income fund is is part, i guess it's part of our total income range of etf portfolios we've we've got quite a number now um uh, but the pref let, let's deal with pref tracks mm. so pref tracks um historically access to preference share instruments these were quite particular instruments. They were, remember, they were perpetual instruments. So, in other words, there's no term. There was no there was no um, uh, obligation for the issuers to 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 pay you out the, your capital at the end of the term, um, and they were floating rate instruments. So, very particular asset class. As Simon touched on, the liquidity is really being pulled out of the out of the asset class because of Basel III um, and the grandfathering process that effectively closed out at the end of last year. What it meant uh, is was the banks redeemed their preference shares, most of them, and there are a few still on screen. So we went, A, to the regulator to ask for an exemption. We didn't want investors to be stuck in a liquidity trap. So we've been slowly, as the banks have been redeeming, we haven't been reinvesting into the market. We've been sitting on cash. This was all announced to the market, say, last year sometime. Yeah. Um, at, 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 at a, and, and simultaneously, we've remandated uh, the, the ETF to track an index which we were running in this in the unit trust world this is uh, the yield select bond index um and it's an index that goes out and buys the highest yielding bonds in the market at a point in time now the reason why this is a parallel to prefs is well prefs were perpetual in nature and typically the bonds with the highest yield are the ones with the longest duration so it was as close from like a risk profiling if you look at the volatility of like a long duration bond instrument relative to prefs they look quite similar if you look at their net of tax yield they look quite similar um but but of course there are different instruments so this um pref remandate uh, was approved um uh, in terms of the, the 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 process of a ballot and the remandate happens on the 31st of may um if you're a holder of pref instruments Really, all that's going to happen in your um, BDA account uh, or your stockbroking account is where you were holding PREF instruments. Let's say you held 100. You're now going to hold 100 instruments of the core shares yield select bond uh, 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 ETF. And, and we do all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So the, the portfolio has now completely transitioned into cash. We had to buy ourselves some more time to, to responsibly disinvest from the pref asset class. <laughs> so now we're all sitting in cash. And on the on the mandate change day, we will invest into the underlying bonds, which is all government bonds out at the high yields uh, uh, portion of the curve. So on the 31st of May, you're going to see an instrument change in your in your um in your stockbroking account. And that instrument will then, where it was giving you exposure to prefs and sort of transition into cash will now give you exposure to SA government bonds out of the out of the high yield portion of the curve. So that's kind of operationally what you're going to see. So don't don't freak out if you see pref tracks disappear and something strange appear. That that something strange is the new instrument. <laughs> and if you see pref tracks disappear and nothing replaces it, please uh, let us know or or, or your stockbroker because because it's a corporate action that that should automatically happen on on your end. Yeah, if you don't get it, something went wrong. And Kobus, remember, one of the key benefits of preference shares is they're paid 
dividends. And there's a tax implication on that. Of course, this now will fall away. It's going to be income. There's nothing we can do about it. It, it is just what it is. Basel III, uh, literally, as I said, put a spoke into this. EJ, you say check trading on OST, liquidity very low. Uh, fair point. And it's it's exactly an hour 35 old. Uh, but there are market makers, as with uh, all other uh, ETFs, uh, passive ETFs. So there are market makers. And I can see the market maker in the screen there. Uh, Penis, you're asking what category will I find at the fund on easy equities? That's a great question. I would say under ETFs. I don't know if they're going to open, have a new special space that will say uh, 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 active ETFs. I don't know if they're going to distinguish it in that way. Um, but if you can search by code on on uh, easy equities, uh, the code is income, as in the word income. So in that sense, nice and simple there. Uh, just checking if there are any more questions coming through on my Twitter. Uh, we've touched on that. We've touched on that. And we've touched on that. A question coming through from Anonymous, the one part in it, uh, frequency of, of rebalancing. I mean, is this, uh, Chris, is this going to be sort of dynamic or will there be a Hawkley sit down and, and, and do? So our, our process really looks at the investment opportunities relative to the outcome that we're looking to deliver. And our process, whilst we've got a sort of a, a monthly asset allocation meeting with inputs and, and outputs, the markets can move quite significantly in a short space of time. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage for that outcome over a three-year time horizon. We're not trying to make calls in terms of what we think is going to happen in the market over the next week or the next three months. So it's always back to managing over that long-term time horizon. But if the markets move quite aggressively, that impact valuations in terms of the type of returns we can expect over the next three years there, there may be changes in the portfolio. So it's not rigidly stuck to a, a quarterly rebalance. It's, it's based on market conditions. If markets move dramatically, there may be changes. If nothing happens in markets, you can expect kind of the, the, the asset allocation to remain the same. Okay. A couple of folks asking on two, uh, 38 points plus uh, VAT, so nice and cheap in that regard. Uh, and I don't see any new questions coming through. So we will park that there. Uh, Chris Eddie, Chris Rule, really appreciate your time this morning. Ladies and gents, appreciate you attending. Uh, it will be on the Just One Lap website. Uh, let's say within the hour, I've just got to do some top and tailing on the video get it onto YouTube and the like. It will be up there. It is trading. Uh, folks are seeing it. If you're not seeing it, poke your broker. There is an issue there. Gents, really appreciate the time this morning.